So here we are, this is uh, Gospel of Matthew for Beginners, lesson number 10, uh, Relationships in the Kingdom, kind of the title of this uh, particular lesson, and we are at Matthew chapter 18, so if you want to open your Bibles there, if you're following along in your uh, Bibles. So remember, the, um, one of the main things that Jesus is talking about here uh, is um, the kingdom, right? is the kingdom, uh, a lot of talk about that in the book of Matthew. And so far, Jesus has given a lot of parables and a lot of teaching on the idea of the kingdom. For example, now we're not going to go over this very long, I'm just going to list them to you for you quickly. So he's talking about the kingdom that was coming in Matthew 4.17. Uh, there's discussion, the kingdom is at hand. Then uh, the kinds of people that live in the kingdom, chapter five, right? Those who are poor in spirit, those who are meek, you know, the, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. That's, a, that's the kind of people that live in the kingdom. So Jesus talks about that. Then who is the king of the kingdom in Matthew chapter six, right? When he does the prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, it's God's kingdom. He's not talking about a human kingdom. Then he talks about the importance of the kingdom in chapter six, right? Seek ye first, what? The kingdom, the importance of the kingdom. And then who will enter the kingdom in chapter seven, verse 21, and who will enter the kingdom? Well, those who obey, right? Many will say, Lord, Lord, you know, on that day, but God doesn't know you if you're not obeying. And then in, let me just get another slide up there. In Matthew 11, uh, how great are those in the kingdom? And Jesus says, you know, John the Baptist? Well, no greater than John the Baptist, right? And then he finishes that particular discourse by saying what? But those in the kingdom, the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. So he talks about how great are those in the kingdom. Um, then he gives another parable, not everyone will respond to the kingdom, chapter 13. The parable of the sower and the seed, right? Some, some seed falls uh, by the wayside and, uh, and is trampled underfoot. Finishes that by saying, you know, some seed gives a yield of 30 fold, 60 fold, you know, 30 to one, 60 to one, 100 to one. So he talks about um, uh, you know, who will respond and uh, he teaches the idea, of course, that not everybody will respond to the kingdom. Uh, then um, uh, he talks about punishment. Uh, God will punish those not in the kingdom. Again, he uses parables. You know, the weeds and the wheat, talks about that, and the dragnet and the fish, you know, this idea of selection. You know, there's a, there's a, a gathering and then there's a kind of a selection process that goes on in the kingdom. So he talks about those who will be punished, who will be cast aside, who are not in the kingdom. Uh, and then he talks about the, the, the growth. How does the kingdom grow? And he says, well, it's mysterious. You can't see it. And he gives the parable of the mustard seed, for example, or, or the leaven put in, into the dough. You don't actually watch it growing, but you know, it's, you know it's happening. You know it's growing. And then, of course, the kingdom is the most precious possession that one can have, and there he talks about you know, the, uh, the parable of the, the treasure that's found in the field, or the pearl of great, uh, pearl of great price. And so he uses parables you know, throughout Matthew to instruct his listeners on how you know, valuable the kingdom is, who will come into the kingdom, and so on and so forth. So with that thought in mind, we move ahead now into chapter 18, where he's going to talk about relationships within the kingdom. So until this time, Jesus has talked about the kingdom itself in a, in a collective way and the response that people should have when presented the news of the kingdom. But when we get to chapter 18, the Lord begins to describe the nature and the quality of the relationships that those who are in the kingdom have with one another. And that's a topic he hasn't, you know, he hasn't broached yet. You know, how do people get along in the kingdom? What is the quality of their relationships? And so he begins with the idea, the basic premise, is that the basic thing that happens in the kingdom, as far as relationships go, is that people care for one another. 
People care for one another's soul in the kingdom. So I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but let's at least read this section here, kind of get us going, chapter 18. It says, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and said, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that those in the kingdom are meek and poor in spirit, dependent on God, you know, all qualities that are embodied in an innocent child. If you look at a child, the innocence, isn't that what we like about children? I mean, among other things, but we love the innocence about them. They kind of, they trust what you say, you know, that's what's humorous about them. They just come out and, you know, and they're honest, right? In, in, what, they, in what, they, what they see. And so the fact that the disciples actually asked this question, who is the greatest, that that was on their mind, suggests that there are certain problems going on with them, problems of pride or strife among them already, because why would they ask who's the greatest, who's the boss, who's in charge, you know, when somebody's always thinking those terms, not exactly team players. So Jesus, in response, points towards the objective of their conversion. You want to see where you're heading towards? You want to see as a, as a citizen of the kingdom what you are working towards? Hang on a second, he brings a child and he says, okay, this is what you're working towards. This is, this is the goal of your character. And so, you know, what is it about a child that, 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 that people in the kingdom should be cultivating? Well, no dependence on achievement or power or greatness, but a kind of a, a quiet, innocent trust in God. Children are trusting. They trust their parents. You know, if mom says we're going to go tomorrow to whatever, to the Brahms or something, well, that's cash money. Mom, mom said so. Mom said we're going to do this. I mean, we're going to do it. There's no doubt in their mind, right? And so Jesus is pointing them towards the quiet, um, innocent trust that children have to be a thing to be cultivated in us as adults. So true greatness in the kingdom is to achieve the goal of wanting no glory for self, but rather glory for God. The emptier we are of self, the more God can fill us with His greatness and His wisdom, and His love and His power. That's the idea, becoming like a child uh, the, 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 the process of becoming childlike is the process of emptying ourselves of personal pride and personal striving and so on and so forth. And why do that? Well, because then God will fill us with Himself, with His Spirit, His attitude, so on and so forth. So not only are the greatest like children, uh, but they must also accept or treat others in the kingdom who are meek and humble and vulnerable with respect. You know, as Jews, or, or as Jesus rather, would have them do, uh, not manipulate them or despise them. You know, it's always tempting to treat someone, an, another adult, okay, who is innocent and trusting, there's always the temptation of taking advantage of that person because it's easy to talk them into things and it's easy to you know, brush things off on them and to uh, manipulate them in some way because they're trusting and they're childlike in their attitude. Another thing he talks about, uh, so he said this is the, you know, they've asked the question, who's the greatest? So he points to a child, this is, this is what you're shooting for. Then he says another thing about the child and their attitude and that is he gives them a warning against offenses. And so in verse six he continues, he says, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into the internal fire. 
If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. So Jesus issues a warning to those who would cause either a physical child or one who has become childlike in their innocence and in their trust, those people who are in the kingdom, he warns, make sure you don't do anything to cause them to disbelieve or to stumble or put something in their, in their way. And so he demonstrates by the severe warning that he gives them how precious these are and important. Consequently, how important they should be to us. And that's evangelistically, you know, I, this is a great passage here for the idea of cultivating an evangelistic spirit towards children. Not only our children, all children in the church, uh, obviously one of our most important works is the work that uh, the uh, brothers and sisters, mainly the sisters, do in teaching children from the very beginning. I mean, they're open, uh, you know, I don't know about you guys, but little kids that I see, they're anxious to go to their classrooms, they're excited, they, they participate. You know? So Jesus warns those of us, in because this conversation here is about people in the kingdom. He's not talking to people outside the kingdom. He's talking about people in the church. And he warns people in the church, be very careful that the way you act and what you do does not cause a, a brother or sister innocent in Christ to stumble, and especially not little children. And it also suggests that they uh, can believe. And all we do while they are young either contributes or destroys the innate ability to trust and believe in God that a child has or a childlike believer wants to have. You know, some people say, well, you know, that boy, he was only 11, he was baptized. You know, I mean, does he have the faith to understand all the things? Well, you know, maybe not, but he has faith. <laughs> You know, he may not have faith to understand the deeper things, you know, but he has faith. He really does believe as true that there is a God and that Jesus died for him. And he may not know the depths of sinfulness that we might know at the age of 20 or 30, but his faith is faith. It's the faith of a child. It's the repentance of a child. It's the obedience of a child, but it's acceptable to God nevertheless. God never said, only the people who have really sinned badly you know, should repent. And only those who can really understand you know, the metaphysics behind you know, how, how the Holy Spirit dwells in us and who is the man of lawlessness. And, you know, uh, he didn't say that. He just said those who believe and are baptized. He didn't qualify it to age or anything. And so we have to you know, I believe we have to be you know, proactive in teaching children in the church and not get in their way. And also, it recognizes the dangers in the world, but specifically points out those who are a direct cause of stumbling. And the stumbling here, the Greek word, is for a trap. And the type of trap, you know, like a bear trap that just closes you know, and, and kind of injures the animal that you cannot escape from. He said, be very careful that you do not entrap an innocent child or an innocent, you know, someone who has an innocent heart in Christ. And it's also a warning to personal weakness and sins that can be a cause for self to stumble. Things that we bring <coughs> upon ourselves that cause us to stumble, those things need to be removed as well. You know, if your hand sins, if your eye sins, you know, He's talking about you know, Christians again. He's not talking about the world. He's talking about us and the church. If there's something that's going on in your life that continually draws you into sin, you have to get uh, radical, is his point. You have to be ruthless in, 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 in cutting that thing out because the, 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 the objective of that bad habit, bad thing, sinful thing, the objective is simply to destroy your soul. And Jesus warns us uh, very uh, emphatically about how, um, as I say, how, how ruthless we need to be in getting rid of temptation and sinfulness in our life. And then he reinforces the idea that those who are least in the kingdom, you know, the children, the innocent ones, are truly precious because even the mighty angels who behold the face of God, 
they minister to these little ones. So it demonstrates their greatness and it points to the care that should be experienced in dealing with others in the kingdom. People in the kingdom are precious to God. You know, heaven help those outside the kingdom who harm them. There'll be a, you know, there'll be a day of judgment for them. You know, Paul talks about that in 1 Thessalonians. You know, one day the ones who are persecuting you, they will be judged and punished. You know. But he also warns the people inside the kingdom, and you too, you need to be very careful how you treat one another in the church. And so then, you know, after he said this, he gives another parable, I won't read it, but from verses 11 to 14. Remember, he's answering the question, who is the greatest? And he says that the smallest, the humblest, the least, those are the greatest in the kingdom. Therefore, he instructs them in different ways here. First of all, the direction of their development if they wish to become great in the kingdom. So you apostles, you're wondering who's the greatest in the kingdom? I'm going to tell you who's the greatest. The least, they're the greatest. The ones who aspire to serve, they're the greatest in the kingdom. The ones who are actively you know, eliminating sin in their lives, they're the greatest ones. So he does give them an answer to their question. Secondly, the care that they, he talks to them about the care that they should exercise in, in not harming these. And then of course, the value that these, the innocent ones, the childlike ones have before God. How valuable are they? Well, mighty angels minister to them. And he gives a parable illustrating the joy that the father has when one who has been lost is found again. That's, that's where that parable of the, the lost sheep fits in. Who's the lost sheep? The lost sheep, isn't, the lost sheep in the context isn't somebody out in the world. The lost sheep are the one, is, is the one that was in the kingdom and then wandered away. That's the lost sheep. You know, he says the 99, they're in the flock. They're saved. But then one wanders away for whatever reason. Perhaps the, you know, in the context of what he's talking about, perhaps they wandered away because they were offended in the church or they were hurt somehow or they were neglected or they just kind of faded away and nobody reached out to whatever. There's a hundred different reasons why people stop coming to church. You know. So Jesus is saying you know, when we go out and we find that lost one and bring them back, there's great rejoicing. Of course, that's not to negate the teaching of preaching the gospel to the lost, of course. That's in Matthew 28, go into all the world, you know, make disciples of all nations, that's over there. Over here he's talking about in the church. You know, sometimes um, when, um, uh, uh, when, when entering a new work, you know, uh, preachers in their training, one of the first things that uh, they're taught if you're going to a new work is you know, you're new to that particular congregation, get to know the congregation, obviously, and then get a list of people who have fallen away, stopped coming, so on and so forth, and start there. <laughs> you know, your first job you know, as the preacher is not to go start door knocking you know, on strangers' doors. Eventually that can come in a variety of ways. But before you do that, how about going to find the lost sheep how about getting out there and finding the lost sheep, the ones who have confessed Christ, who were saved, and now are risking their salvation for whatever reason? Because they've been hurt, because they're entrapped in some kind of sinful behavior, or sometimes it's not even sin, sometimes it's doubt. They just, nobody's been answering their questions, and they just kind of back away slowly, and you don't see them anymore. Go find those lost sheep. That's a, that's a ministry in, its, in itself. So we, have, we end that section with a parable demonstrating the father's joy when one of the little ones who was lost because of stumbling or whatever and now is found. That parable serves as a bridge to the next section in this chapter about practical conflict management within the kingdom when offenses occur. So I told you, Matthew's well organized, right? So he, he talks about the kingdom, the kind of people that should be in there, and, and, and he, 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 he gives where Jesus warns about being careful about conflict and offenses, and then he goes on to say, now when offenses do happen, here's what you got to do. 
So there are a variety of ways that individuals deal with personal conflict in the world, right? Sometimes they go out and get revenge, or they get angry, or they give them the silent treatment, or they gossip about, you know, somebody's hurt your feelings and so we round up a posse, right? We round up a posse and you know, our posse or our, our gang, you know, when we get together, what we do is we tear down this other person over here. I'm not saying we do that, I'm just saying those are different ways that people react to being offended. So Jesus outlines the way that personal conflict is to be resolved in the kingdom. Always keep that in mind. He's talking about in the kingdom. So in verse 15, let's take a look at that. He says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. So from be careful that there be no offenses, to okay, when there are offenses, here's what you need to do. There's a procedure involved. First, a personal and direct confrontation with the issue and the person involved. I want you to note that the objective is to win the brother, not win the argument. Big difference. To win back the one who has offended you, not to prove that you were right or you were hurt. Because that's normally what we do, right? We, all right, I'll go see them to try to convince them to see how hurt I am and how what they did really hurt me. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. You're trying to win the person back. So when we're sinned against, we want the confronting, but Jesus says that we must make an effort to renew the fellowship with the offending one. The objective is not to demonstrate how the offending one hurt us, the objective of the entire thing is to win back the fellowship with the one who actually offended us. Pretty tough, I realize that. Now, first of all, there has to be a real sin that happened. It can't be, I don't like the way he cuts his hair, or I, you know, I, don't, I don't like his attitude, or he seems smug to me. You know, that, the, this is not sin here. This is not you know, if you're offended because so-and-so you know, doesn't smile much in the morning or you know, doesn't, didn't say hello the last time, these are, this, you know, Jesus is saying, make sure there's a sin there, not just an issue of annoyance or opinion. A sin that is done against a brother directly and threatens to destroy the bond of fellowship within the assembly. The bigger picture is if you were offended, if someone has directly offended you, what's at stake here is the fellowship between you and that person. That's what's at stake, not just your feelings. Because when two break apart, that's the beginning of a, you, know, you, want to, uh, you want to rip a, a piece of cloth, what do you do if you don't have scissors, right? You, you light at it and then you, you rip it a little, but once you've ripped it a little, right, then you can go to town. So he's saying, okay, that there's a little rip there because of an offense. Your objective is to repair the rip. Reprove here means to convict or to show him the wrongness of the act. So number one procedure. Number two, if there's no response, make sure that the offense is recognized as such and has been witnessed by two or more brethren. And this is done to assure the brother that it isn't just a personal vendetta, but a serious wrong witnessed by others. In other words, it's not just in your imagination. Oh, you're just imagining that. That didn't really happen, you know. That's why you have the witnesses. Also, if the matter comes before the church, it can be verified by more than one person. If this fails, 
then bring the matter before the entire church. And here, you know, there is no New Testament example. We don't see this happening exactly in the New Testament teaching or inference on how the church is to deal with this person. Maybe in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about a certain individual. Certainly to continue to exhort and encourage him to repent in a collective way would be right. That's what he's talking about in verse 17. Now if this fails, he says, to bring a response, the person is to be disfellowshipped. Very difficult thing. When he says Gentiles and tax collectors, these people were not considered part of the assembly of the Jews. So the Jews didn't consider Gentiles as part of their assembly, their fellowship, or tax collectors. So Jesus is saying in the same way, if you've gone through all this process, you reject that person, they're not part of the fellowship, they're not part of the assembly. And so the brother who fails to respond to the church is also not part of the kingdom because you've put them away. Now note that Jesus places the church as a collective unit as the highest authority. There isn't, there isn't an appeal body beyond the church. The local church is the, you know, if somebody says to you, how do you know the local church you know, doesn't have a higher authority, a regional director and a, you know, a continental supervisor or something, because when Jesus is talking about uh, discipline in the church, he doesn't name any other body other than the assembly as having authority in this case, and we see it in other places too as well. There's no authority or body higher than the congregation. Now, this is, this is the way that Jesus says that we ought to approach the solution of an offense you know, one on one. And you know, after all the years that I've had preaching, I so rarely see this happen. What I see instead is, okay, somebody offends me, says, I don't know, whatever, does something that really is offensive, okay? Lies about my, something I did or whatever, whatever, okay? What I see is that will go to the elders or to the preacher. I can't tell you how many times I've had people come to my office, you know, come on in, you know, and uh, I need to talk to you. Okay, you know, and, and it turns out I get the story that this person offended that person sitting in front of me. And my first question is always the same. Have you spoken to Brother Joe? No, I came to you first. And so we say, well, let's get our Bibles out, shall we? Let's go to Matthew 18. And I think the reason people don't do that is because, well, they don't like confrontation. You know, it makes them nervous. Sometimes they don't want the confrontation because they're not quite sure that the offense is really you know, that big a deal. And I guarantee you that when, when we go to a brother or sister in love to, to appeal to them, and if they see that the objective is that we want to renew fellowship, we're not trying to beat them up or convince them that we know, you know, when it's really, I just don't want us to be apart. I don't want our fellowship to break over this particular event here. I suspect that the majority of the times it doesn't go any further than that. Then he talks about authority. Okay, so process first, authority next. He says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two uh, of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. So Jesus confirms with the statement of binding and loosing that whoever they Pro, uh, process in this manner, their actions will be with the authority of heaven. Why? Because something has happened, we are reacting to it exactly as Jesus has asked us to do so. Well, when I'm acting exactly as Jesus has told me to do so, then I have authority. 
Uh, when someone comes to me and says, what must I do to be saved? I say, well, you need to believe in Jesus and confess His name. You need to repent of your sins and, and be baptized in the name of Jesus. And I feel very strong authority. I can, if that person says, Is my sins are really forgiven, are you sure? I can tell them 100%, I'm absolutely sure. I can speak with authority. Why? Well, because I'm doing exactly what this says. I, didn't invent, I did not invent any of that. In the same way, we speak with authority for discipline in church matters when we are following exactly the pattern that Jesus has given us. We can do these things with authority. So if they forgive a brother, his sins are forgiven in heaven, to loose. And if he refuses to repent, he will be out of the assembly on earth and his sins will remain. They'll be bound and so will they be in heaven. So we're not usurping some sort of authority. We're not kind of taking on ourselves some sort of, you know, who do you think you are, God? You know, we're, no, we're simply following the pattern that Jesus has given us to deal with these, with these issues. So when the church gathers to obey and honor Christ, He is with them and, and He is there to answer their prayers in matters of discipline or any other matter as well. And some people take this passage and really stretch it out of context. You know, uh, if we're two people meeting in my living room, you know, we're the church. Uh, no, because <laughs> yeah, that's not what he's taught. He doesn't talk here, he doesn't teach here um, uh, on the subject of what constitutes the church. He's simply saying when the church gathers together, no matter how big or small it is, to um, exercise discipline, if you follow what I teach you, I'm there with you. I'll back you. If you say this brother, his sins stay with him because if you, he refuses to repent, know that I, I, you know, I back you on that. I, I, I support you in this thing. I mean, we, we even know it as parents, right? You got four kids, we did anyways, and if we went out and we were leaving you know, somebody in charge, you know, we never left Paul in charge, that's for sure. Because, but, but anyways, if we left one of the kids in charge, what did we say to them? We would look at the younger ones and say, all right, now you listen to what Julia is saying, and if she gives us a bad report when we come back, there won't be any back talk. So when you're listening, you know, if she says it's bedtime, you better not play around, it'll be bedtime. And let's not hear, but this is exactly what Jesus is saying. You know, I've put you in charge, the church, this is how you ought to do things, and if you do it the way you know, I want you to do it, I'm backing you up when it comes time for judgment. All right? All right, then he goes on, the basis for maintaining relationships. Remember, this whole section is about relationships in the body not relationships. Why does Matthew 18 does not necessarily work that well you know, in the world? Because it's not meant for people in the world. People in the world have other criteria on how to deal with these type of things. So the process, the authority, now the basis for maintaining. How, how do you avoid these types of things? How do you repair these types of things? So Jesus prepares us for life in the kingdom by describing how precious it is and how difficult it is for sinful people to grow in love and in faith. It's not easy. Take 400 people, put them together in one unit as a church, there's bound to be trouble. So this section deals with the practical side of daily life in the kingdom. So he warns against causing someone to fall away from the kingdom because of what we do. Then he instructs on how to be reconciled when there are offenses and what to do with those who cause the offenses. Finally, he establishes the attitude of heart that we all need to have if we're to avoid causing others to fall or falling ourselves. In other words, what kind of attitude do people have as far as relationships are concerned within the kingdom? The attitude, the attitude is unconditional forgiveness. That's the attitude. That's the mindset that we need to cultivate within the kingdom to maintain good relationships and peace. And so in verse 21 and 22, he demonstrates, or Matthew demonstrates, the old standard. So let's read it. It says, then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? 
Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. So Peter's question follows the previous discussion concerning forgiving the offending brother. The old Jewish teaching was that three times was enough. Three times. If you forgave the same brother you know, three times, you were doing good, according to the law. So Peter's offer seven times demonstrates his own growth as a disciple in comparison to his previous faith. So Peter's grown. Wow, when I grew up three times, now I've been with Jesus and yeah, he wants more. So how about seven times? That's, seven's a good number. You know? So <laughs> Jesus kind of establishes the matter beyond the legal requirement by setting forth a new attitude, not just a new number. 70 times seven actually means a number beyond count. It's not seven times 70, you know, uh, 490. It's beyond count. The new attitude is a forgiving heart, a willingness and a readiness to forgive whenever called upon to forgive. And believe it or not, you're called upon to forgive every single day. Every single day. How? You're driving along and you're in a hurry and then the old guy in front of you is driving his car, you know, we're in a 45 zone and he's doing 28. And you're in a hurry and you've got things to do. I need to be a little forgiving. You know what I'm saying? Every day people, you know, the girl at the, at the restaurant, the waitress at the server at the restaurant, you know, she's, not, you know, she's expecting a tip but she's not giving you a lot of love. You know what I'm saying? The food comes on, bing, bang, boom, it's late, it's cold, she forgets to fill your drink. You know? A forgiving attitude. You call and you need information from a government agency. Boy, you need forgiving attitude big time, right? But you know what? The person at the other end of the phone, they need to have a forgiving attitude too because they got to deal with people all day long who have problems and mix-ups and things like that. So we can't mandate this in the world. I don't think, I don't think in the uh, human resources booklet that you get when you go work for wherever, for Tinker or something, I don't know if a forgiving heart appears anywhere there. But in the kingdom, it's uh, SOP, right? Standard operating procedure is that we, we begin with a forgiving heart. That's what Jesus is saying here. Jesus then tells the parable of the, you know, the unjust steward to underscore this idea. I'm not going to read it. You know the, the unjust steward. He owes like millions of dollars to his master. Master says, OK, you got to pay up or else you know, I'm putting you in jail. And the guy begs him, please don't. You know, I, have, I have a family. And so the king has compassion on him, forgives him. And then a lesser slave owes this slave just a few, you know, a few hundred dollars, pay up or else, oh, just give me a chance. No, throws him in jail. And then the king or the master finds out the unjust steward, what he did. He said, hey, I forgave you. Couldn't you forgive this other person here? Well, because you did that, you're going to go, that guy's coming out and you're going in. Right? That's, the, that's the parable. And so, with this parable, Jesus is showing the extent of what forgiveness should be. The original servant could not pay what he owed the master, and yet the master forgave him anyways. The result and the punishment reserved for those who were not prepared to forgive others. That's the point that he's making. And then in verse 35, he summarizes the entire passage by warning against the hardness of heart that refuses to forgive the brethren, they, uh, uh, the brethren their offenses. I, I've always said that the minute, I think, I forget if it was Mike or Marty, somebody, or it may have been our guest speaker on Sunday, you know, the, day that you're, the day you decide you've had enough, no more forgiveness for that person, is the day that God decides, okay, no more forgiveness for you either. You, know, you turn the tap of grace you know, flowing down on that person as you're turning the tap off, the tap above you for the grace that's falling down upon you is being turned off in heaven. I know it's a kind of a 
a crude uh, analogy, but it's pretty much what Jesus is teaching here. You maintain your own state of grace and ongoing forgiveness by doing and extending that to, to other people. So the lessons about the kingdom here that are taught, when it comes to offenses, well, first of all, make sure you're not the one causing the offense, either to another person or to God by willful, continual sinfulness. So make sure you don't do that. Then number two, deal with those who do offend in a Christian way when it happens. Remember, the, the, the objective of a, you know, when you're not, you know, when there's friction between you and a brother or sister, the objective is to repair the fellowship, not win the argument. And then finally, forgive others readily and graciously when you are offended because in the measure you forgive others, God will forgive you as well. All right, so we finish 18, moving on here. We're almost done. Another couple of lessons, we're done on this one. All right, thank you for your attention.